Welcome to Hi-Fi Fitness. I'm Dennett, the host and producer. I wanted to give a follow-up to our last show, which was Paleo versus the Vegan. This one was about Freedom Fest. How does freedom and fitness relate? This is actually going to be one of our most important episodes ever. And I, I want to give a little background. I was at the Freedom Fest event in Las Vegas. I was there and I was able to bring my camera in and record some of these healthy living sessions. So during this show, you're going to learn the link between health, freedom, and also some pointers. What, what are the two most important vitamins to take? As long as a whole host of other little tidbits and useful tips. We have joining, or well, we have clips on this show from John Mackey, the CEO and founder of Whole Foods. I had to slide a, a, a little ending in from uh, Steve Forbes, who I find is quite the motivational speaker. Also, John uh, Durant, the uh, Paleo Manifesto, I, I had a nice interview with him. I do have to say I was able to get a good interview in with John of the, the Paleo Manifesto. However, John Mackey of Whole Foods would not let me interview him. I did get a picture with him, so I'll, I'll show our viewers the picture I took with him. You must have asked him about GMOs. <laughs> I asked him, and he said, well, <laughs> he said if I do an interview with him, it would have to be approved through his uh, people at the store. However, I did uh, record his speech, so we'll get a few clips from, from, from his uh, speech. And he actually gave three different talks here. One was on uh, conscious capitalism, which mm -hmm. is pretty interesting. He's looking at how, um, how businesses can be more conscious and mm -hmm. make better, help make better choices. Mm -hmm. Basically, capitalism with love or looking out for the, the overall good. Yeah. I think the, the main takeaway there is businesses are not in business just to make money. You're not a fitness trainer just to make money. Right. You're a fitness trainer because you love fitness. You want people to be healthier. Right. Okay. So actually, what is your, your real click, what is your, uh, your business's mission or your personal mission? Uh, to help as many people as I can. Um, look and feel their best. I feel like I'm in the background. So if you want to you know, have the best TV show on the planet, and my goal would be to help you get there through coaching you on your food and your sleep and you know, your, your exercise. So, All right. Yeah. Well, let's uh, take a look at the clips from, from Freedom Fest. And then we'll come back and give a little follow-up, wrap-up, and analysis at the end. So watch, and uh, I want to see what, you, what your key takeaways are. Feel free to leave messages on my YouTube or some comments on your thoughts and uh, feedback to this show. Thank you. Now let's uh, watch that clip. But very few people ever retire from watching TV. Most people begin their work lives at age 21, 25, if you're sending a child to graduate school, age 40. But people begin watching TV often in the United States when they're one or two years old. At the end of a typical American life, an American will have watched 13 years of television. We spend more time in our lives watching TV than anything else other than sleeping. Obama and various big government politicians need to distract you from their true agenda. I call it WMDs, Weapons of Mass Distraction. Throw the bums out. Throw the bums out. No. Things are not right, ladies and gentlemen. There is no doubt the great American middle class is being murdered. Um, I've had the opportunity to come here three years in a row now, and it's a wonderful event. Uh, I'm a very libertarian or orientated person, as I think most people who work out are, because they take responsibility for their own personal health. And being a libertarian and being a fitness enthusiast go hand in hand. In other words, you don't look around, wait around for people to take care of you. You go out and take care of yourself and get yourself in the best shape you can be. Let's go to organic food stores whenever you can and uh, eat the best that you can, and you're all set. An all-natural and organic, when possible, diet. Uh, I do fudge a little and get non-organic produce sometime, but generally, for things like strawberries, for example, I won't eat anything but organic. Um, 
but I think you should always follow a natural food-based diet. Try and stay away from processed foods. Cakes. And I have a little bit of dark chocolate every day, which is supposed to be good for a lot of different ailments and everything like that. Um, and I came across an approach that said, um, for any species, what you do is you look at how the species lives in the wild, the lifestyle it's adapted to, and then you can mimic that. And that, that's a good starting point. It gets you 80% of the way there. It doesn't mean that life in the wild was perfect, but it's, it's a good starting point to think about what any given species is adapted to. And then a lot of the health problems that people have today are a mismatch between um, our ancestral lifestyles in the Paleolithic and um, in ancient times and the lives we lead today. Well, there, there, were, there are hunter-gatherer cultures that have widely varying carbohydrate intakes and um, there was not one single diet throughout the course of the Paleolithic that was eaten. The Paleolithic was a 2.6 million year period. Uh, there was a, v a variety of things that were eaten there. So there's no one, quote, paleo diet. Um, but that said, mimicking uh, it within some general parameters, a lot of people are going to find that's beneficial. But then if, if you want to add in some individual foods and see how you do on them, you know, see how you feel. Maybe you tolerate dairy fine or, you know, maybe, um, you know, m maybe rice is, it sits well with you, so... So two uh, areas I wanted to mention. One is what about the fact that most of our plants have been domesticated, so you can't really get what our ancestors ate anymore? Well, that, that can be good or bad. Um, domestication uh, will often reduce the bitterness of different foods, and so that's actually reducing some of the toxins, um, some of these bitter-tasting compounds in food. So that's good. Um, but at the same time, the fruit that we eat is sweeter than it was in the wild, and people eat all these grains and legumes that um, are very difficult to gather and collect and grind and bake in the wild, and, and those have some drawbacks too. So um, domestication is a double-edged sword, and it, and it always has been. If we are going to stay as healthy as we can for as long as we can, then it's super simple. All we need to do is copy what nature does. Now, what I'm saying there is that if we have a certain machine and it's broken, do we get parts for that machine? Or we get parts that don't fit that machine? All right, our bodies are made up of nature's molecules. Uh, let's see. Um, now here I'm not talking about protons, neutrons, and electrons. Let's go to the next stage. They're made of proteins and carbohydrates and fats and essential fatty acids and a whole lot of other natural stuff. But you know there isn't one molecule of a patent medicine, which is also called sometimes a drug. But I prefer to call them what they are because you see we cannot patent natu nature's molecules by law. Therefore, if we're gonna make megabucks, we have to patent something. So what scientists are in the very bad habit of doing, and this has been going on for the last century, is taking a natural molecule and changing it just a little bit so it isn't quite natural, and now we can patent the sucker, and we can afford to pay Los Federales at FDA $1.2 billion, which is what Forbes magazine, not me, says it costs to get approval from FDA. Now, I respect that approval about this much. You ever heard the whole thing about, old thing about those who do, they do. And those who can't do, they teach. Have you heard that one? All right, well those who do, they do. And those who can't do, they teach. And those who can't do either, they regulate. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, if we copy nature, if we do that, we're the most likely to stay the healthiest for the longest. Now notice I didn't give any guarantees, but most likeliest to stay the healthiest for the longest. It's a deficiency of lycopene, which is the red stuff in tomatoes and watermelons. It's a deficiency of stuff in olive oil. It's a deficiency of all the stuff that's in a good natural diet. And if you want to pick on one thing, pick on lycopene, folks. That stuff really is a protector against UV damage to the, to the skin. Malabsorption, it's a gut problem, it's not an eye problem. And we're not digesting and absorbing the food well enough, and we don't absorb enough of it to get to the eyes, and so the, the eyes are under the most 
UV and other assault all the time, they fall apart first, which is where I got off on the skin. It takes the skin a while longer to fall apart. We check everyone who comes in with macular degeneration for low gastric acidity. The large majority have low gastric acidity. What do you do about it? Well, you just go down to the health food store and they got replacement hydrochloric acid capsules and you take them. Some Indian research scientists noticed that there were certain provinces in India where hardly anybody was ever reported to get Alzheimer's disease. What's going on here? Basically, they tracked it back to the turmeric consumption. Those were provinces in which turmeric was thrown into everything in the cooking. And then somebody got even um, smarter, I guess, and tracked it down to the curcumin fraction of the turmeric. So you can buy expensive little curcumin capsules, or you can just keep a five pound thing of, of uh, turmeric next to your stove. That's what Holly does. I gotta admire her, she is so thrifty. She goes to the Indian Spice store and buys five pounds at a time and just throws it into everything. Uh, Cause neither one of us wants to uh, get any Alzheimer's and actually I think it tastes good. So there's the one you can do without even needing a doctor. Yeah. Are you able to come up with a quick summary of a recommended supplements? or things that you want people to add to their diet, such as turmeric? Well, um, I'll start and then I'll ask uh, Dr. Wilkinson to add some to it. Us doctors are always adding supplements to people's lists if we're into this. Um, but there's two really basic things that nobody should be without, and those happen to be vitamin C and vitamin D. Stuff um, where you don't need your doctor, and you're not gonna kill yourself with vitamin C ever. Uh, we like to be there for things that are complex, that yeah, you gotta go study on, but there are so many simple measures we can keep ourselves healthy with. And the second one is vitamin D. Now, um, if you happen to live in the tropics and you get out a fair amount, but you don't burn yourself to death, your vitamin D blood level is going to be between 60 and 100, what's called nanograms per deciliter. And by the way, nobody ever died of vitamin D toxicity in the tropics. I guarantee you that, nobody ever did. Okay, what happens when we measure the average North American Ah, University of Arizona did a wonderful study. They asked for people living within 50 miles of Tucson. <laughs> Three quarters of them were below the tropical optimal, mm -hmm. living in Arizona. So most of us as adults have to take at least 5,000 units a day to stay there. Now, why would we want to take that vitamin D? Because remember, we're dealing with copy nature and people seem to have originated in the tropics and migrated out a long time ago, our ancestors. So we're accustomed to that. I mean, after all, why were Adam and Eve wearing fig leaves anyway instead of clothes? They didn't need clothes. Sunny, nice and warm and everything. Um, so we should get that same amount that the species was created in or was evolved in, whichever you'd like. That's vitamin D. So this is too basic. I mean, these are unhealthy foods. So low carb movement has done a great service to the American people if they can get people to stop eating those foods. Those are the single foods that people should eliminate first from their diet. That's a very good thing. Um, but I think they throw the baby out with the bathwater when they eliminate the starch foods that we have built our diets around since, well, probably through all of history. And I'm talking about things like yams, winter squashes, brown rice, oats. Uh, wheat's a tricky one. I don't want to go into it here because wheat's been a, a, a plant that's been altered in some ways and we've eaten so much wheat, a lot of people develop gluten intolerances and allergies from it. That's why you have this whole gluten-free movement. So wheat's a tricky one, uh, but you could still eat a very, uh, base your, uh, your calorie intake on starch foods and not ever eat any wheat. I mean, most of the Asian peoples have built their diets around rice. Rice is a particularly non-allergenic food. Next slide. How about the paleo diets? Because paleo diets are incredibly popular right now. If you go on to Amazon.com and you look at the 20 best selling diet nutrition books, I just did it, 13 of them relate back to paleo. Paleo is, is a very big movement and it's a big movement for a couple of reasons. A, Americans are addicted to meat and so any diet that tells them they should be eating a lot of meat is a diet that's gonna be popularly re received. And secondly, by eliminating the refined carbohydrate foods, the paleo diet is so much healthier than the standard American diet that people will get good results from it. They can lose 100 pounds in less than a year. 
I've seen it happen over and over and over again. Uh, weight loss is, uh, um, it's, it's people are, we create it through what we eat. We can uncreate it by changing what we eat. And, and then all the rest of your health will follow along with that. You know, if you get control of your diet, you'll get control of your whole life. You'll want to exercise more. You'll take on other healthy lifestyle habits. That, you can do the same thing. If you get exercise and get that, you'll want to eat a healthier diet. It's all connected. So just take responsibility for your own health. And, that's, and I think eating small quantities of nuts and seeds is very healthy. But if you're, if, you're, if you're eating massive quantities of nut cheeses that are processed and you're getting them in the stores, even at Whole Foods, it's not a super healthy food. You could do better. I said I had breakfast today. I have a rice cooker with me, small little rice, portable rice cooker. I cooked up steel cut oats, added some blueberries, organic blueberries to it, and a little almond milk, and it was a great, great breakfast. When you travel and when you eat out, it's very difficult. Most restaurants serve remarkably unhealthy food, full of salt and oil and sugar. And that's just the reality of it. And uh, you got to find good ones that don't, or get the cooks to be cooked the way you want to. You can almost always get steamed vegetables or salad. And if you just put a little balsamic vinegar on it, don't put too much oil on it, you can get a healthy meal. But it's tricky. Oh, yep. learn how to cook. No, honestly, or, or, or marry someone who does. <laughs> because, because it's very hard to be healthy unless you are, uh, uh, on, on a regular basis, cooking and eating really healthy food, unless you go completely raw, and I'm not sure that's a healthy diet. I think we're out of time. So, yes, thank you very much. John. Ultimately, we are here to make sure that the student movement for liberty continues to grow, continues to be a force for societal change. Issues and how liberty applies for every individual, not just a few privileged individuals. Student movement. It's good to help integrate the student movement. This is a truly global movement for liberty. This isn't just about Americans. This isn't just about the West. This is about freedom for the entire world. Well, I'm here to represent Students for Liberty and to help advance liberty throughout a larger network. Why a Freedom Fest for health and fitness? Where does health fit into freedom? Well, you can't have much freedom if you're sick. I mean, certainly if you're sick and in bed and unhappy, it just doesn't work for you. So obviously we all need to keep up with our health and we need to do even more so because the medical profession is missing a whole layer of prevention and that's what we really need to focus on as individuals. Okay. I like to think of it as individual responsibility and I think taking responsibility for ourselves goes hand in hand with the freedom. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of where I see it fitting in. Sure, sure. And today there is so much nutritional knowledge. We can actually keep ourselves pretty healthy for long periods of time. And if we need the medical intervention, it's there too. So you mentioned vitamin D in your talk, and I do read Life Extensions magazine myself. I've mm -hmm. found they do some good research. So do you have any comments on uh, vitamin D? Well, it's good for just about everything, um, and we probably don't get anywhere near enough of it. Um, as again, I mentioned in my talk, there was a review article that showed that different blood levels help different things, you know, from, from rickets, which of course is what we normally think of as vitamin D deficiency, to heart attacks and cancer, and a bunch of things in between. So it's a very valuable thing like many other nutrients. And, and that's, you know, something that we're just really appreciating now. It used to be we thought, we only need low amounts of these vitamins, but actually, yeah, that just helps us with the very bad diseases like rickets. But when we have optimal levels, we can have more optimal health. So folks that are looking for optimal fitness, really looking to get in shape, they do need to take considerably more uh, where can people find information about what levels they should be taking? Well, I like the Life Extension Foundation, LEF.org. I also like Jonathan Wright's uh, Health and Nutrition Newsletter, and that's W-R-I-G-H-T-S. He's really a, a pioneer in the nutritional research area. So those two sources are my favorites. Now, what about supplement regulation? I mean, we have so many crazy supplements out there. A lot of them don't seem to be very well regulated. Do we need some more regulation to help consumers get better products? Well, actually, in some areas, we have too much regulation. And what we can tell consumers about vitamins is what is so heavily regulated. It, the FDA doesn't think the First Amendment applies to what it calls commercial speech. <laughs> and the manufacturers, of course, if they put it on their website, 
uh, will be uh, will be censured by the FDA. The FDA has recently sent letters to cherry uh, growers and walnut growers because they actually cited studies on their website saying that components of their products were very healthful. And components of their products probably are very healthful. Yes, they are. So <laughs> what um, what should consumers be told about products? Well, I think uh, it should be just like the internet. Everything should be out there, and the consumer should decide for themselves. Okay, and how did you get interested in this? What what made you want to write this book? <laughs> well, I was reading about our foreign policy one day, and I, it kind of all came together for me, if you will. Um, I realized that the ends and the means are intimately related. If we use aggression as our means, we're going to get very bad ends, even if our intentions are good. And that applies to the health sector as well. By all means. So when we use aggression to stop vitamin manufacturers, for example, from telling us about the benefits of their product, you know, we're using aggression and it backfires because before we are FDA uh, regulators or government officials or whatever, we're all people and we want to be healthy and anything that stops that hurts everybody. So that's a big issue. You know, what we feed our animals, uh, you know, makes them healthy or unhealthy, and in turn, will have that effect if we eat them. So it is a very important area. Yeah, I uh, like to steal the phrase from Michael Pollan: "We are what we eat." Eats. So you add the one more level to that. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's hard to know what we're eating. I mean, you know, that's not something that that's not information that is out there normally. We don't buy a piece of beef and and it tell it doesn't say what they've fed the animal, for example. I certainly think as part of liberty, we need a lot more freedom and transparency about our food and what we're eating. Mm -hmm. That's something I'd really like to see more information. And we are, because the internet doesn't let us keep secrets anymore, so I think that's all going to come out. Uh, so come and exercise your rights of free assembly and getting your points out there. That's the only way you begin to change. Otherwise, as mentioned yesterday in a panel on health care, you mentioned uh, Harris Rosen, uh, the government will ossify how things are done. The whole health care delivery system has been ossified by Medicare in 1965, assuming that was the way health care is delivered. Well, it was 1965, but this is now 2014, and there are a whole slew of ways of delivering health care. I mentioned the, uh, this little device, no bigger than this, where you put your couple of fingers under it, takes your EKG, and tells you in 10 seconds whether you got a problem or not. And that kind of thing is just coming more and more, making health care accessible to you. You don't have to go to some place. Did the, did the government come up with that uh, technique? Or was that, uh... <laughs> well, I'm sure Al Gore invented it. I just haven't gotten word of it. We get in a rut, we find a way to get out of it. If one thing doesn't work, we'll try something else until we do. And that's the key thing. Not that uh, we're, we grow, but that when crises come, we find a way around them. And that's the inspiration for 200 years. We've had everything and we found a way to continue to move ahead. And that's what we got to remind our leaders, and if they don't get it, new leaders will. Welcome back. That was some really valuable information. Two most important vitamins, vitamin D, vitamin C. Take personal responsibility for your health. It's really about having choices and taking action, being responsible for what you eat, and also, it all goes together. Fitness, mm -hmm. what you're taking in, what you're eating, how you're exercising, and having these freedoms and liberty to pursue a life of happiness. I want to thank our viewers for watching High Five Fitness. Again, I'm Dennett, the host and producer. I hope you enjoyed this special edition with the clips from Freedom Fest. Thanks again to the folks at Freedom Fest for uh, letting me shoot the clips there. Go out there and get fit. <laughs> Good. And I believe every politician should be limited to two terms, see if you agree with me, one term in office and one term in prison. <laughs> if they shred the United States Constitution with executive orders, throw the bums out. And I have good news for you. After all that bad news, I have good news for you. The war isn't over. The battle has just begun. We've all come here today to celebrate the, the American higher standard of freedom. We shouldn't use the computer and our phones in fear of government. The government should act in fear of us. Talking about Freedom Fest, freedom, liberty, personal responsibility, health. Dr. Uh, Jonathan Wright, he had some interesting ideas and was pointing out um, 
the most important things on your health. Or, uh, he uh, actually said that it's about going back to nature. So it was interesting. I saw the connection between what he was saying and what uh, John Durant were saying. Both were saying we need to go back, take a few steps back and go really to what humans were eating a while earlier on. So what's your, uh, what's your takes on going back? Yeah, I mean, some of my mentors, you know, say it very simply. If it wasn't around 10,000 years ago, we probably shouldn't be eating it. I yeah. think they'd both ag both be agreeing with that if it wasn't around 10,000 years ago. Maybe 5,000. <laughs> <laughs> A lot has changed in the last 10,000 years, though. So. It it has. Yeah. So I actually had a chat, a chat with uh, John Durant mm -hmm. uh, of the Paleo Manifesto. I said, well, hey, have, have, our, have our plants and foods been modified through the years and domesticated? Mm -hmm. <coughs> he pointed out a lot of good came from that. So, for example, a lot of plants used to taste, they were more bitter, and basically we've bred them and yeah. led them into crops which are, are something that we can really feed a lot of people from. And, so not all of the domestication is bad, and I think that's one thing. Paleos, we don't really want to go back five or 10,000 years ago and eat what they ate, because a lot of it didn't taste that good. Life expectancies weren't that long, but we do want to eliminate over-refined and processed foods. Most definitely, yes. And I think we do also want to move and exercise more. At, at the very beginning, there was a clip of, I think at the end of, at the, end of the average lifespan, people have spent the average American spent 13 years watching TV. So real quick, do you have a 30 seconds to comment on that? Well, I mean, you know, sitting is the biggest problem that we have, right? I mean, you know, everybody, especially in our area, Silicon Valley, everybody has a forward head and rounded shoulders. And, you know, we have a number of overuse injuries. And, you know, and then people hit the gym, you know, they only make things worse by doing push-ups and bench press. So, yeah, we need to move. We need to have good ergonomics at our, at our chairs. We need to sit better you know, be tall right now, you know. Um, you know, the sitting is dangerous, so we need to move, the body's made to move, and, you know, we, you know, even, you know, the, the goal is 30 minutes a day now, so have an effective 30-minute exercise routine, and that's what I do for my clients. So take 30 minutes out of your TV program and work out. With that, I'm gonna call an action for our viewers right now to stop watching this program, stop watching TV, go out there and get some exercise. Thank you for that motivation. Good to have you in the studio with us. All right, thanks, Brian. What's your next boot camp? Every day. <laughs>